Hello students. In the previous video of the lesson on saying please, we have seen how the author Alfred Gardner talks about the importance of being courteous and how good and bad behavior can affect us and the others around us. Let us see what he tells us further. When Sir Anthony Absolute bullied Captain Absolute, the latter went out and bullied his man Fag. Whereupon, Fag went out downstairs and kicked the page boy. Probably, the man who said top to the lift man was really only getting back on his employer who had not said good morning to him because he himself had been henpecked at breakfast by his wife to whom the cook had been insolent because the housemaid had answered her back. We infect the world with our ill humors. Bad manners probably do more to poison the stream of the general life than all the crimes in the calendar. For one wife who gets a black eye from an otherwise good-natured husband, there are a hundred who live a life of martyrdom under the shadow of a moros temper. But all the same, the law cannot become the guardian of our private manners. No decalogue could cover the vast area of offences and no court could administer a law which governed our social civilities, our speech, the tilt of our eyebrows and all our moods and manners. Now let us see what the author is trying to tell us here. The author gives us an example from a play, The Rival, by Sheridan to illustrate the point. In the play, Sir Anthony Absolute bullies his son who gets annoyed and passes on his annoyance to his personal servant who in turn goes and kicks one of the lower servants in the household. Trying to trace the route of the lift passenger's rude behavior, Gardiner guesses that the problem might have begun with the housemaid who had been rude to the cook who as a result might have been rude to his mistress, who in consequence might have passed on her annoyance to her husband, who ultimately passed on his annoyance by being rude to the lift man. Bad manners, in his opinion, are highly contagious and poison our life in general than the entire list of legally recognized crimes. If a woman is boxed by an otherwise gentle husband, there are many more who suffer in silence from bad temper. Yet, the law cannot do anything in this regard. No decalogue could make a list of all the harm inflicted by manners, moods, facial expressions, etc. Nor can these be dictated by any law. Further, he says, But though we are bound to endorse the verdict against the lift man, most people will have a certain sympathy with him. While it is true that there is no law that compels us to say please, there is a social practice much older and much more sacred than any law which enjoins us to be civil. And the first requirement of civility is that we should acknowledge a service. Please and thank you are the small change with which we pay our ways as social beings. They are the little courtesies by which we keep the machine of life oiled and running sweetly. They put our intercourse upon the basis of a friendly cooperation, an easy give and take instead of on the basis of superiors dictating to inferiors. It is a very vulgar mind that would wish to command where he can have the service for asking and have it with willingness and good feeling instead of resentment. What is he trying to tell us here? He's trying to say that although everybody must necessarily support the law in the case of Liftman, people will paradoxically feel sympathy for him. Just because the law cannot compel us to use expressions such as please does not mean that we can do away with customs that are more sacred than even the law. One such custom of civilized man is to acknowledge a service. Gardiner here says that words like please and thank you are the small coins we pay on our journey through life as civilized human beings living in a civil society. 
These courtesies allow us to live in society without friction. Besides, these words also help to keep cooperation between human beings on a level of friendliness and goodwill, instead of dividing us into superiors who order and inferiors who are ordered about. The author says that only a very vulgar person will order for a service which he can have by merely asking. This is so because, whereas a small request will provide the service with goodwill, an order might provide the service but only with resentment. So we need to choose, do we want to request for a particular service or do we want to order it? I should like to feature in this connection my friend, the polite conductor. By this discriminating title, I do not intend to suggest a rebuke to conductors generally. On the contrary, I am disposed to think that there are a few classes of men who come through the ordeal of a very tiring calling better than bus conductors do. Here and there, you will meet an unpleasant specimen who regards the passengers as his natural enemies, as creatures whose chief purpose on the bus is to cheat him, and who can only be kept reasonably honest by loud voice and an aggressive manner. But this type is rare, rarer than it used to be. I fancy the public owes much to the Underground Railway Company, which also runs the buses, for insisting on a certain standard of civility in its servants and taking care that standard is observed. In doing this, it not only makes things pleasant for the traveling public, but performs an important social service. Now, what is he trying to tell us here? Here he recollects another incident. He goes on a state that he wishes to hold up the example of a friend of his whom he calls the polite conductor. Now he is using an adjective here, polite conductor. He hastens to add that by calling a particular conductor polite, he does not mean to imply that all other conductors are impolite. In fact, he says, given the difficult nature of their jobs, most conductors go about their work in a very good-natured manner. There are, of course, exceptions. Here and there, one meets resentful conductors who look upon the passengers as their enemies who have to be kept in check throughout aggression. But such specimens are fewer than they used to be. And Gardiner thinks that this is because the Underground Railway Company, who manages the bus service, imposes a certain standard of polite behavior in the men who work for them. This, he feels, is an important bit of social service that also benefits the passengers. So here he says that this company has made sure that its employees are good towards their passengers. And if they are good, the passengers in turn also will be good to the others that they will come across. It is there not therefore with any feeling of unfriendliness to conductors as a class that I pay a tribute to a particular member of that class. I first became conscious of his existence one day when I jumped onto a bus and found that I had left home without any money in my pocket. Everyone has had the experience and knows the feeling, the mixed feeling which the discovery arouses. You are annoyed because you look like a fool at the best and like a knave at the work. You would not be at all surprised if the conductor eyed you coldly as much as to say, yes, I know that stale old trick. Now then, off you get. And even if the conductor is a good fellow and lets you down easily, you are faced with the necessity of going back and the inconvenience, perhaps, of missing your train or your engagement. Having searched my pockets in vain for stray coppers, and having found I was utterly penniless, I told the conductor with an honest, as honest a face as I could assume that I couldn't pay the fare and must go back for money. Oh, you needn't get off. That's all right, said he. All right, said I, but I haven't a copper on me. Oh, I'll book you through, he replied. Where do you want to go? And he handled his bundle of tickets with the air of a man who was prepared to give me a ticket for anywhere from the bank to Hong Kong. Now here the author 
gives us an incident where the politeness of the conductor is shown and he too is shocked to see this kind of reaction from the conductor he was expecting in definitely something else having made it clear that he has nothing against conductors in general gardiner tells us about his first interaction with the polite conductor it happens one day when he boards the bus without realizing that he has left home without any money in his pocket it happens one day when he boards the bus without realizing that he has left home without any money in his pocket this being an experience common to most people the author feels that the reader will know the feeling such a situation evokes now we all have come across all this kind of situation in our life somewhere or the other we have come across by mistake we have forgotten to carry our purse and hence we are not able to pay the fare one feels either like a fool or a crook almost expects the conductor to look at him suspiciously and imply that this is a common trick played by crooks and be asked to get off the bus even if the conductor believes him and is kind he is still left with the necessity of going back home for his wallet wasting a lot of time and not being able to do what he had set out to do finding no coins at all in his pockets gardiner tells the conductor that he must go back home to fetch some money at this the conductor shockingly tells him that he does not need to get off and he readily takes out a ticket and gives it to him i said it was very kind of him and told him where i wanted to go and as he gave me the ticket i said but where shall i send the fare oh you'll see me some day all right he said cheerfully he turned to go and then luckily my finger still wandering in the corner of my pockets lighted on a shilling and this account was squared but that fact did not lessen the glow of pleasure which so good natured an action had given me now here when the author told him the destination the conductor handed the ticket but when the former wanted to know where he should send the money the cheerful reply he got was that he was bound to meet the latter some day on some bus now this happens with us we definitely owe someone something and we want to return that amount to that person and we ask them where should they where should we send that amount to for them to be received and then here in this case the conductor said you don't need to send any money anywhere we will definitely come across sometime later and that time you can pay for it luckily for gardiner he found a coin in his pocket at last and managed to pay, pay the fare the joy however that such pleasantness on the part of the conductor gave him did not diminish even a tiny bit thus students in today's video we have seen how we can make a difference in someone's life by just being kind and polite thank you and have a nice day